Pay attention because I am going to tell you the most extraordinary tale of a military operation that took place in 1943 in this video, which has been sponsored by The Great Courses Plus, but more of that later. Now, I want you to imagine that you are British and that you are trying to assess the situation in, say, February 1943. And I'll give you a big clue here. Things did not look good at all. Uh, for one thing, the Congress Party was uh, kicking up a lot of fuss and uh, stirring up revolutionary fervour in the general population around the country. There was the constant threat of disturbances and riots and so forth uh, as, as people were campaigning for independence from Britain. And so that was a bit of a, a thorn in the side of the uh, authorities. But to be honest, that paled in insignificance uh, next to the considerably more pressing matter of the fact that the Japanese were just about to invade. Yes, the Japanese had conquered pretty much all of the Far East by this point, had come smashing through Burma, and were just about to hook round over the top of India and come down and uh, take over India and, and end British rule there. It was all going to be over pretty soon unless something uh, pretty spectacular were done to prevent it. So you could imagine that people were rather blinded by those two problems and a lot of them weren't perhaps paying enough attention to a third problem, which was that in the Arabian Sea, to the west of, of India, between India and Africa, uh, an awful lot of shipping was going down. A lot of shipping was going down. Now that used to be the haunt of Japanese submarines, but they had all gone east for a bit and had been replaced by their allies, German U-boats. There were a lot of German U-boats in the Arabian Sea. and amazingly successful German U-boats. They were sinking about a ship a day. A ship a day! Big, I'm talking about big cargo freighters, Greek uh, freighters and Norwegian and Dutch and Danish and of course British uh, uh, ships were being sunk every day by these amazingly successful U-boats. How were they doing this? It's as though they knew exactly when and where to be. And it was worse than that. They even seemed to know what the ships were carrying and how important those cargoes were to the British. Because when a U-boat was presented with three targets, it would always pick the one with the, the most desperately needed supplies aboard it. These ships were going down. They couldn't be replaced that fast. And of course, their precious cargoes were going down with them. This was unsustainable. Something had to be done. Otherwise, um, the, the, the supply situation was going to become hopeless. But how were they getting this information? Spies, presumably, but yeah. But how? Where were these Germans? In India? There are, are there German spies in India? Really? They didn't know about them. Well, um, one uh, possibility was uh, suggested by radio intercepts. Um, you see, the British were amazingly good uh, at triangulating uh, from many, many listen listening stations, uh, not just around India, but I think they also had lis uh, listening stations in uh, places like Yemen and uh, across the water in Africa. And they could triangulate the source of a broadcast. And there were these irregular broadcasts. They were, they were common, they were almost every day, but uh, they would be a different time every day and they would be uh, broadcast at a different speed. Um, but the codes were quite definitely German. And at this point in the war, the British were able to decode uh, German uh, signals. And yes, what they found were alarmingly detailed reports of exactly when and where a ship was going to be and carrying what. How, who was getting them this information and how? Well, they triangulated it not to British India, but to Portuguese India, because on the west coast of uh, what we today call India uh, was a place called Goa, and this was an old Portuguese colony. And it was neutral because Portugal was neutral. This was neutral territory. And the triangulations were more specific than that. Not only could they say they were coming from this, this tiny uh, colony of Goa, but they were also coming from the main port. Um, Mama Goa, or Mama Gao, as some people called, uh, call, uh, call it, but uh, Mama Goa is what the British called it at the time. And they could be more specific even than that. It wasn't coming from the land. It seemed to be a little way offshore, actually, in the, in the, uh, in, in the, in the waters off the coast. How is that possible? Oh, right. Yes, of course. They had aerial photographs and they had intelligence reports. There were, in fact, four Axis freighters um, anchored just off the um, off the, the, the docks, the quaysides, in Marmagoa. Yeah, it's presumably one of those. There was an Italian one and three German ones, but pretty quickly they thought it's the Ehrenfels. It's the Ehrenfels. They weren't, they didn't know, but they were pretty darn sure it was the Ehrenfels because 
what had happened was that the Ehrenfels was in Calcutta and uh, they knew that one of the two top German agents in the Far East, codenamed Trumpeter, was aboard and the British had tried to nab him. They were hoping that he would step foot uh, off that ship and they'd pounce and arrest him on some pretext or other. They could think about that later. They just had to get him. But he stayed aboard for a very long time and lots of Nazi sympathisers were going there to uh, meet him, presumably, and then coming back off the ship again. They were watching intently, but he never stepped foot on shore, so they couldn't get him. They, he never got off that um, German boat onto British territory. And of course, there wasn't a war, so they couldn't force their way on. So mm, there was nothing they could do apart from watch and wait and hope, and he never came off. But on the day that war broke out, that ship, without permission and without using a harbour pilot, suddenly sailed out and, by a very difficult and risky sea route, went all the way around India and got itself uh, interned for the rest of the war in neutral Goa, along with these, these other uh, two German and one Italian ship. So there they were, anchored offshore, anchored very thoroughly with the four big anchor chains, two at the stern, two at the bow on each, so they were supposed to not be going anywhere because they were not supposed to violate neutrality. That's it, they had sought refuge in a new neutral place and they were supposed to see out the war there. Now the Portuguese had uh, searched the ships and had disabled their transmitters because they wouldn't want them violating neutrality by sending useful messages uh, to the enemy. So uh, that had been done, but <sighs> the British were thinking, well, surely it's not beyond the wit of the Germans to have had a, another a transmitter hidden craftily somewhere else on that ship. They knew a few more things about that ship. The Ehrenfels was a very special ship in lots of ways. Now, when it was in Calcutta, uh, an agent uh, a British agent posing as a fire inspector had gone on, on board uh, because he had to do a fire inspection, make sure that the ship was safe, and he demanded plans of the ship just in case he needed to come aboard later and put a fire out. He needed to know where he could connect his fire hoses, where his men could go, where all the, the, the bulkhead doors were, and you know all the things that a fireman would need to know. And so they managed to get hold of plans, and he had a, a look round the ship, and he was pretty convinced that there were actually guns uh, stashed very cunningly below decks. More was known about the Ehrenfels. You see, after World War I, the Germans had to sign various documents promising, dip, 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 honest, that they wouldn't uh, build more than a certain number of warships or a certain um, uh, warships bigger than a greater size. Now, yes, of course, they did violate those treaties, but they were trying to stay within the letter of the law, at least uh, apparently. Anyway, the Ehrenfels was designed to be very quick and easy to convert into a cruiser. And the British knew this. Yes, it was a, a freighter at the moment, but there were spaces on the deck where you could very quickly put gun turrets. They also knew that in Singapore, which was now in Japanese hands, there were some gun turrets just like that in um, now in Japanese hands. So if the Ehrenfels could make it to Singapore, it could very quickly become a very effective and threatening cruiser. And they didn't want that. Yes, so there was the trumpeter connection, there was the, the cruiser design, there was the suspicious uh, behaviour in Calcutta, and yeah, it all added up. But the Portuguese were quite insistent. Oh, no, 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 no. They said, no, no we, we searched the ship and there is no transmitter there. Yeah, but according to uh, radio intercept triangulation, yeah, there was. And the ships were going down at an alarming rate. So, Something had to be done, and who would you ask for the job? Well, maybe Colonel Lewis Pugh of the SOE, that's the Special Operations Executive, or Department of Dirty Tricks, as some people refer to it. Now, Royal Navy Intelligence rather looked down uh, on SOE, not just because it was a, some upstart, uh, youthful organisation uh, impinging on its uh, territory, but also because, well, they just didn't play cricket. They were known to do things like plant false documents and use blackmail and even kidnapping and things that, frankly, the British oughtn't be doing. Although I dare say, because there was a war on, most people were content to just uh, look the other way for a bit. Anyway, Colonel Lewis Pugh was having a meeting uh, in a little bungalow in Meerut, which is not far from Delhi. Um, this was this was out in the sticks, a little bungalow out in the sticks. Now, later on, um, uh, Mountbatten would uh, uh, turn up and he would take over as commander and he would enormously increase resources to SOE and it grew into a much bigger machine. But at this point, it was just a little bungalow in the sticks. Um, and the sign outside said Ministry of Economic Warfare, which wasn't a complete lie uh, because you know, that was the parent organisation. Um, anyway, they, they did 
odd jobs, uh, if, you, if you get me. And most people were sensible enough not to ask too many questions. So they were thinking, right, it's probably the Ehrenfels. It's probably coming from Goa. And there's this trumpeter guy is probably involved in some way. What can we do? You see, they couldn't violate Portuguese neutrality. Um, this was very important and they'd been given quite definite word from the British government, no, you are not to violate Portuguese neutrality. Uh, there were meetings in Admiralty in London about this and th th they realised this was the same problem because they had to keep Portugal neutral. At the, at the time, Portugal, yeah, it was neutral, but it was sort of leaning towards the Allied side and they didn't want it to become a Spain leaning towards the Axis side. Uh, a number of reasons for this. Uh, the British were using um, refuelling stations in the Azores um, thanks to Portuguese uh, permission, which was extremely handy. Um, and uh, could you imagine how difficult it would be to get in and out of the Mediterranean if there were coastal batteries of German guns on the south uh, west coast of Portugal overlooking the Pillars of Hercules and the Straits of Gibraltar. That could be very inconvenient indeed. Yeah, our, an entire nation's effectively swapping sides. It just wasn't worth the risk. Okay, so we cannot violate Portuguese neutrality. It wouldn't make us look good on the world diplomatic stage. Okay, that would be bad. But these ships are going down and something has to be done. Um, so they came up with a plan. It could have worked. In retrospect, it was actually a bad idea. It didn't work, but it might have worked. I don't think anyone could blame them for trying. They got a, an Indian agent and sent him there to bribe the captain of the Ehrenfeld to just, you know, sail it out uh, beyond the three mile limit uh, into outside uh, Goa's uh, territorial waters and then perhaps the British could uh, just you know, nab the ship uh, off them and uh, yeah that'd be fine and he would become the captain would become a very rich man and this was tried but the captain said no so the Indian agent said well I need up to the amount of bribe but no the captain said no he pro almost certainly guessed that the British were behind it the bribe was in rupees after all um, and could he really trust the British to keep their word? Would he be paid that money? Would he really become a rich man? And besides, he, he had a lot of loyalty uh, to uh, the fatherland. He had portraits of Hitler on his uh, cabin wall. So, yeah, he didn't take the bribe. <clears throat> All right, that didn't work. So, um, they thought they would test just how good this spy network is and, and just how current this information was. Um, so they put it about that there was going to be a, a big gold bullion delivery and they got a carpenter in the local market to knock up quickly a, a convincing crate with rope handles and they filled it full of sand so it was flipping heavy and then they gave it a, a very convincing armed guard and the armed guard didn't know that it was sand in there and they were told it was something very very valuable so okay and they loaded it onto one transport and onto a train and it made its journey through various um, railway stations and the like um, across the country and yeah sure enough a uh, very short while later dit, 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 da 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 comes from some message from apparently uh, Goa saying expected gold bullion delivery and uh, one box cited here and there oh in, in the journey at one point of course someone who wasn't in on it dropped it and managed to crack it and it started leaking um, leaking sand and one of the officers with it who was in, in on it went <laughs> had to sort of, uh, just cup his hand over the leaking bit and uh, get it through. Yeah, yeah, it makes a good anecdote. Anyway, okay, so they really do have a current and effective spy network and yeah, uh, people are feeding information from outside Goa somehow to that station and that's broadcast. Okay, right, so we're convinced now. Um, we've tested it and yep, yeah, this is definitely a clear current threat. Something's got to be done, but what? What could we do? Who could do it? So you can't just send it. The obvious thing to do would be to send in a submarine or some landing craft or something full of Royal Marines and then just take over the ship. But that would be a, a, a flagrant uh, breach of, of neutrality or to send in a battleship and blow it up again. Yep, no, too obvious. That's not going to work. All right. We get the Indians to do it. Indian not acting for the British Army, but Indian communists who are striking a blow against fascism because at um, this stage in the war, uh, the Germans are attacking uh, Mother Russia, so they'll, that, that, that'll, that, that'll be good. They'll say we're, they're striking blow for Mother Russia against Mother Russia's enemy. You see, yeah, play, play that angle. Unfortunately, the communists were doing what communists generally do, uh, which was fight each other, and they were, did, had no energy at all for fighting the, uh, the Germans. Okay, so that wasn't going to work. Um, all right, 
How about this Trojan horse thing? Uh, they take supplies aboard the ship, but what they don't know is there's a load of explosives hidden in the supplies. Uh, they put it down in the, the hull of the ship. Boom, it sinks the ship. That could work. Yeah, it could work, but they decided that what was enormously more likely to happen is they'd put the supplies on the deck of the ship um, and they would go off on the deck where everyone could see. It went off on the deck and everyone said that must have been a bomb then, not some engine room explosion or whatever on the ship that could be explained away uh, and it would do very little harm to the ship and would give the game away and uh, that's not going to work. All right, all right, all right. Will we get the Portuguese to do it? No, no, the Portuguese uh, are really not on our side here. We, that we can bend the rules slightly but we can't get the Portuguese to, to invade a, a, a German ship and take it over. Um, not, not if they want to remain to be seen at least to be neutral even if they do lean our way a bit, they're already quite angry with us actually because of our insisting that there is a transmitter on there, but, but they keep saying, no, 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 we destroyed all the transmitters. Well, okay, you didn't, but. <clears throat> all right, new plan. We'll kidnap Trumpeter. Two agents go to Goa and kidnap the guy, bring him out. There you go, that should, that should work. And then we can interrogate him, get some more information out of him and maybe, you know, crack this whole case wide open. Okay, so let's do that. Um, but Pew thought, right, I need a really convincing alibi for why I'm there. He made a 2,000 mile trip uh, to Calcutta just to get a letter. There was someone he knew, it was a guy called Colonel Bill Grice, who was the commander of the Calcutta Light Horse. And um, he was an old friend of his and he, he said, uh, yeah, Bill, could you give me a letter, make it look convincing, uh, uh, giving me instructions, because uh, you're a very successful businessman and so forth, say I'm working for you, you're giving me instructions to go to Goa on some uh, business errand of yours, put it on nice headed note paper, make it look convincing, and it's clearly come from here, uh, and no one is going to go all this way to check, it's just so far away, and no one's going to think that I came all this way uh, to organise this, so um, yeah, it'll be fairly convincing. Could you give me the letter? And uh, Colonel Lewis uh, did, but I've mixed the two men up. Grice is the colonel of the CLH and Pew is the SOE man. He was a little disappointed that his friend had come all this way really just for a letter. Now, he, was, he wanted to do his bit for the war, so of course he would do this, but he was hoping that his bit was going to be a, well, a bit more than frankly just giving someone a fake letter to cover some story or other. You see, um, a lot of men like him had been deemed too young to fight in the First World War, and now we're being told that they were too old uh, to fight in the second, and it seemed to them that they'd missed both of the great shows, and they really feel, felt a bit aggrieved and frustrated at this. They wanted to do their bit, but damn it, there they were in Calcutta, and no one was asking them to do anything. Lots of other men of the Calcutta uh, Light Horse had left to serve in various other units, but you know, he was still stuck there. And he told Pew, look, if there's anything that crops up ever, you know, you can always count on us. We've got those really good men. Uh, they'd, they'd be really game for anything and, um, well, Pew said, well, okay, fair enough, um, I'll bear that in mind, but for now, just thanks for the letter. Uh, Bill, Bill Grice, by the way, was a self-made man, uh, came up through the ranks. Um, the, the, the Calcutta Light Horse was completely democratic for ranks. Everyone was elected, so you could, if people thought you were great, uh, get elected to a, a senior um, a post very, very quickly. Um, uh, and uh, he uh, was known for being very direct. And I love the story where we said that uh, he used to say grace at uh, big functions and uh, he would just stand up and hi everyone and say, thank God, and then sit down. That's, that's, that's my kind of guy. Uh, brevity, I, I know, <laughs> brevity. Yeah, if only. Eh? But anyway, apparently people like my videos to be quite long and I fear that this one is going to be quite long. So. Um, so they got a car and they resprayed it beige, uh, not just to improve it in general, uh, but also because beige was the most common colour of uh, people on business trips uh, working as contractors for the British government. So they thought that it would it would seem fitting and reasonably nondescript. So beige it was, and off they set uh, for Goa. Um, but on the way, they were thinking to themselves, hmm. We're going to need maybe a cell. It might be a good idea to have a few things planted and ready so that when we uh, come out with Trumpeter, we can uh, put him in, in some holding place and get him interrogated quickly and quite close to the scene because information might be really current. We might be able to save a ship that was you know, had been betrayed just that day. So they stopped on the way in a town that was uh, quite close to Goa and had a word with the chief of police there, 
who eyed them with deep suspicion. No, he didn't like the sound of their little scheme at all, these SOE guys. He didn't trust them and uh, he thought this is trouble because uh, at this point uh, in uh, a palace outside Pune, Gandhi was on the hung hunger strike and getting a huge amount of um, attention from the world's press for this and this seemed just like more trouble. Are these guys here to snatch Gandhi or someone like that? No, 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 that could spark off a riot and then we really will need the, the, the jails. No, no, uh, you, you get your own, you do your own dirty work, go on, clear off. So, so they did. So they went to the, uh, the local army chief and uh, pretty similar reception really. He did not trust, the, who were these two jokers who'd come to him asking for a cell in a hurry? Uh, okay, so he got on the telephone to um, the commander of uh, Army Group South in India and the two men agreed that these two jokers probably the best thing to do is just arrest them because they might otherwise just get everyone into more trouble than frankly any of this is worth. Right, so they were going to arrest them but rather sportingly uh, tipped them off and gave them three hours head start. Look, just clear off, get a long way from here and then then that'll be the problem as far as we're concerned with dealt with. Clear off. So, okay, they didn't always get uh, uh, cooperation from uh, the British authorities. So, uh, they, they go to um, uh, Goa. Uh, at this point, the captain of the Ehrenfels, Captain Rofer, his name was, uh, he told Trumpeter about the Indian agent who'd come to him and between them they agreed yeah the British are probably be, uh, probably the people behind this in which case we'd better be uh, we'd be extra careful okay thanks for the tip-off and that tip-off might not have happened of course had the uh, uh, well wouldn't have happened uh, if the uh, first agent scheme hadn't been tried but yeah it could have worked um, and then the British would have got a very cheap cruiser um, so they uh, stopped at the uh, offices of the British consul in Goa and just asked him where this trumpeter guy lived and they were furnished with an address and so thank you very much and uh, they went round there and there was the house. Broad daylight they thought okay let's go in and get him. Now uh, the agent, uh, his real name was Robert Koch, um, he had picked the house uh, because he thought that it was fairly safe because there was a junction immediately outside it, constant noise and passing traffic and there was a, a police booth, a little traffic booth in the middle of the junction where a, a traffic policeman was stationed an awful lot of the time and there were a lot of shops nearby that were open very late so there were a lot of eyes about the place. It would be very difficult to, for anyone to take in without being seen. Um, anyway, uh, the British uh, two agents, uh, um, <clears throat> Pew and um, Gavin Stewart, um, just walked straight up to his door and knocked. No stealth involved. And uh, uh, when uh, 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 Trumpeter came to the door, uh, they said, quick, let us in, we have, a, we have a, something urgent to tell you. And this worked. And he let them in and out came the guns. Right, uh, we are British agents and you are under arrest, you're coming with us. And the plan was to knock him unconscious and then bundle him out into the car which was waiting just outside. However, Koch's wife walked into the room. It had not occurred to either of the British agents that he had any family with him and, well, come on, knock him out. The guy whose job it was to knock him out was, well, embarrassed to. I mean, you know, knocking out an unarmed man is a pretty nasty thing to have to do under the, under the best of circumstances, but to do it in front of his wife is, well, you can't do that. And anyway, what if she starts screaming? What's he supposed to do? Knock a woman out? That's just beyond the pale. So, so they, they scrapped that plan and, okay, look, you're coming with us. And they just bundled them out, just, just frog marched them out their own front door, broad daylight, out, daylight, out into the street. And at this point, uh, trumpeter starts trumpeting. He starts shouting to all the people in the street, help, help, I'm being abducted, help, help. And uh, lots of eyes turned towards them and people all around stopped and looked and all the, the, the local natives carrying all the various things about that local natives carry, um, they looked at them and thought, hmm, some pale-faced guys shouting in a language I don't understand doing something with some other pale, I don't know and they just carried on. But the traffic policeman was 
was sort of a policeman. He was a traffic policeman, but he, he felt that you know, maybe I ought to be doing something. And certainly a lot of other people felt that maybe he ought to be doing something. And they were running over to him saying, but, but are you not going to do anything? Uh, anyway, they bundled uh, the, the, the two enemy agents into the car and saw that, uh, yes, it looked like the, the, the policeman was actually getting it together now and was coming after them, so they better floor it and get out of there. So they did, and almost immediately had to come to a halt uh, because there was a crossing of loads of incredibly furiatingly slow things, lots of carts drawn by bullocks and, and people carrying very, very heavy loads and little old ladies, come on! But eventually they got away. Phew, and they drove out uh, into the countryside and uh, with one of them keeping them covered uh, with a gun, uh, the other injected them both in the arm uh, with uh, an, a knockout drug and zonk, they fell asleep. Uh, they then with great difficulty um, cut the wires of the telegraph to Bombay, to, that should slow down pursuit a little bit, and then they made their way to the border, anticipating that getting across the border with two sleeping Germans in the back might be a bit tricky, but actually they didn't have any trouble. They had a, a massive bribe ready um, and they were almost so grateful that they left the bride for the, the guards anyway. Um, and they got out of there and they got back with Trumpeter and they took him somewhere, I don't know, to be interrogated. And it seems that this interrogation uh, was certainly successful because they got a name. Ram Das Gupta was the mole that was feeding him information. And uh, they pretty quickly uh, picked up this Ram Das Gupta and uh, he turned out to be what they referred to as one of the usual types, uh, a disaffected student. He had been thrown out of a university for failing exams, um, and so he was disgruntled and annoyed with the world, and was the sort of person just right for recruitment. Um, and so he could be uh, doing something against the British, and therefore, because it's against the British, that's for India, for the motherland revolution, you know, smash the system, etc. Although it did also help that they were paying him very, very large amounts of money uh, to pass on information that he was privileged to, because um, there were people, there were loads of Indian people, of course, in India, working in all the various shipping offices who, who were privy to the information of where all these cargoes, what all these cargoes were, and where they were bound for. Um, so yeah, he was, uh, and they picked him up, they then interrogated him, he named another guy, they started dismantling the ring. Um, but unfortunately, this didn't stop the broadcast. There were still broadcasts coming from Goa, triangulated to the same point. So taking Trumpeter out of the equation on its own didn't work. What happened to Trumpeter? Well, uh, according to uh, this book, which as you can see is blue and uh, is called Boarding Party and is my main source uh, for this um, this video, uh, according to this, uh, nobody knows what happened to him after the war. Uh, maybe he, he just went and lived on an island somewhere and everything was fine. Uh, Wikipedia suggests that maybe Trumpeter died in British custody. Anyway, I don't know, um, but uh, Trumpeter plays no further part in this story nor his wife Greta. Um, so um, it looked as though they were going to have to destroy the transmitter because they couldn't think of anything else to do. Well, they had no more leads on at the goer end. They could make it a little bit more difficult for the spies to feed information in, but it seems that there was still information getting in from somewhere. Uh, there was quite a, a, a big network. They wouldn't be able to dismantle the whole thing overnight and ships were going down fast. Yep, it was vital. They were going to have to destroy the transmitter. But how? How could they do this without violating Portuguese neutrality and all the same ideas as the, that I mentioned before were discussed again and discounted again? But then Pew said, what if not professional soldiers in uniform uh, or professional soldiers disguised as uh, civilians who, if they were proven to be soldiers, would be technically spies and then shot and would also be violating neutrality. What if instead a load of amateurs just off their own bat, not given orders by anyone, but just, you know, just decided to do it as, as, a, as a private enterprise for a lark? What if that were the case because the British government wouldn't have ordered it. They wouldn't be British troops. So how about that as a mad idea? Now at first it seemed an utterly mad idea but nobody thought of anything better. And of course the Calcutta Light Horse were perhaps the people for the job. No one would suspect them. They were a load of middle-aged accountants and lawyers and tea planters and the like. 
uh, out of condition. Yes, and and they're all respectable businessmen. No one would no one would suspect them, and yet we can be pretty sure that they'd be very keen to take part. Okay, go and find out. So, uh, Pew uh, went to Calcutta and told Grice the plan. And he said, why don't you invite also the Scottish Calcutta uh, boys from, a, from another organisation just uh, across the road. Uh, there was a, a friendly rival organisation, the, the, the uh, Calcutta Light Horse used to play, them, uh, play games of rugby against them, that sort of thing. Okay, get them in on it as well. Um, invite everyone to a meeting and make it clear that there's an opportunity here. They can do something for the war effort to strike back against the enemy, the Germans, and um, also make it clear to them that there will be no pay. We can't pay you because as soon as it's provable that uh, we paid you, then uh, you, were op you were professionals and therefore it'll be violation of neutrality. So we can't pay you. There could be no recognition because that would suggest that orders came from above. Uh, so no medals of any sort. Uh, and if you die, your family won't get any sort of pay uh, pension or compensation. Well, that's not tremendously tempting, is it? And yet, to these men, that didn't matter. Invitations went out, and 30 men from uh, uh, the, the light, uh, Calcutta Light Horse and the, Scottish, the Calcutta Scottish turned up, and once the doors were shut, everything was explained to them, and they asked, so, do we have any volunteers? There were 30 men in the room, and 30 men volunteered immediately. Now a lot of them were really a bit old and had to be said, had to be told that I'm sorry, but you, you really are a bit elderly. Um, but thank you so much uh, for, for for coming along and for volunteering. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, and after a while, they selected four from the Calcutta Scottish and uh, fourteen, so that's eighteen in total from the Calcutta Light Horse. And. Um, I should tell you a little bit more about the Calcutta Light Horse. Now, uh, there was a clubhouse, and this is the only picture I've been able to find of it. This is uh, definitely long after its heyday. Um, there was a clubhouse in Calcutta where the, uh, uh, the unit met, um, but it hadn't actually seen action since 1900, not since the Boer War, and none of these men had ever seen action. Uh, it was formed uh, in 1759 by Robert Clive, also known as Clive of India, uh, in order to um, see off a Dutch invasion with Malaysian um, mercenaries. Um, and actually it wasn't called the Calcutta. He formed a unit which then spawned other units and one of which became over time the Calcutta Light Horse. But by by the 1930s it was really more of a social club. So men arriving in India would join the Calcutta Light Horse because uh, well they could get very cheap lodgings um, and there was a room called the Chummery where the, the, it was sort of a mess for the bachelors uh, there. It was a great way to meet people. You get loads and loads of friends. There was a tremendous social life there. There were all sorts of sporting events that they put on. There was a there was a bar there. And of course, because you were meant to be a cavalryman, you could get subsidised uh, riding. You could get subsidised um, stabling and groom hire and feed and all the rest of it. Um, and they played polo and had gym carners and did paper chases and all that sort of thing. Uh, it was it was it was fun. It was a it was a nice place to stay, nice place to go, good company. Yep. Why not join the Calcutta Light Horse? So that's what a lot of men did. Um, but they weren't really doing it because they had any serious intent of, of being in the army. They just had to go on a, a, a two week sort of jolly camping holiday thing uh, every year um, and uh, turn up to a load of parades. And they looked they looked pretty smart in their uniforms. And a lot of people refer to them as the Calcutta Tight Horse. Tight as in drunk, as in it was just a drinking club. They were just guys who just joined a unit. So they had a, a nice mess uniform. So they looked very smart at dances. But really, that's all they were in it for. They weren't proper soldiers. They were definitely looked down upon by the professional army. So that uh, was the Calcutta Light Horse. And a lot of the men in it had gone to serve, but those left were too old or too important to serve. A lot of these men ran huge estates um, the size of English counties or, or were dealing with budgets that were bigger than a lot of small countries. Um, they were responsible uh, for a lot of things, a lot of, a lot of high power guys there. They couldn't be uh, called up. They were just too important and or too old, but they volunteered. One of them, a chap called Cartwright, 
particularly wanted to serve, and he had a sad story because his son had gone out to Burma and had gone missing, presumed dead, and he was doing everything he could to strike back at, the, back at the enemy. He wanted to join up, he wanted to go to Burma, but they wouldn't let him. Anything to find out what had happened to his son. Um, but they said, look, I, you really are past it, you're too old, uh, but thank you, thank you very much for, for, uh, for volunteering. Anyway, meanwhile, back in Goa, Captain Rofer held a meeting with the captains of all the various ships and said, like, we're pretty sure the, the British are up to something and they might try an assault. They might try to take all these ships by force. They're clearly desperate for ships because so many are going down. So they're trying to get hold of any ships uh, that they can. Uh, they tried bribing me. That didn't work. I refused. Maybe they'll try force. So they started defending themselves. They started um, going uh, ashore and buying up supplies of kerosene and they had pumps and hoses ready for those kerosene uh, to kerosene to, to uh, um, slosh it all over the decks so that they could create a, a firestorm of kerosene on the decks. And they also had amongst their cargo a lot of car batteries and slabs of marble, sheet metal and mining explosives. Now they weren't supposed to have any guns but they could, with all those ingredients, rig up some pretty big and effective bombs on the deck and uh, this they did and very efficiently and every day they would test the circuits, test the batteries, make sure they're still charging them in them, make sure that everything was still working. So they were ready with switches to set off these these bombs that would uh, well annihilate anyone anywhere near them uh, on the deck whilst not actually doing that much damage to the ship itself. Uh, and they had all sorts of other weapons, clubs and crowbars stashed in convenient places. They were going to be ready for any borders. So. Um, they had to have training, of course, because these men were, were hopelessly unfit um, and uh, they, they needed to get up very early in the morning because they had to do all their training before going to work as normal. And uh, this they did, getting up at uh, five o'clock in the morning, which was, which was pretty handy in some ways because if they'd been training in the evenings, their wives might have thought that they were perhaps having an affair, but who has an affair at five o'clock in the morning? Um, but the wives did think it was a bit strange. For a start, why, why weren't all the Calcutta Light Horse going on these training things? Why was it only 14 of them? Uh, but, oh, well, anyway, you're on some special training course. Well, well done, you. OK, dear, and roll over and go back to sleep. And he would then go out, train all day in how to stab people, how to wrestle them to the ground, how to shoot them in lots of ways with various weapons. Um, and then he would go do a full day's work and then there was still the social life in the evening. It must have been a pretty exhausting time. But anyway, this is what they did. They only had about um, a fortnight, no, ten, about 10 days, I think it was, uh, to go through all their training. Um, and then their orders arrived. Now, um, oh, but wait, um, I, I've skipped a bit. They went um, to a place called Force 136. Force 136 uh, was a very exotic unit uh, located at um, the amazing, rambling and extremely uh, exotic and opulent house of an, of an ex-indigo um, uh, planter. And uh, there were Chinese there and Malayans and, Malayans and Burmans and uh, Indians and, uh, and British, all being taught the gentle arts of sabotage and assassination. And uh, they went there to uh, recruit a man known as Major Yogi Crosley. Um, all these people have uh, nicknames, of course, because it was the 1940s. Um, why did they call him Yogi? Well, uh, he was extremely enthusiastic about yoga. Um, one of his things was that he would stand on his head to read the paper. Um, he was a vegetarian. He'd learnt seven uh, of the local dialects fluently. He'd gone somewhat native. Um, but ever since he was a boy, he was uh, mad keen on explosives. And so when the war came along, they thought, you know, I think we could turn your hobby into something a little bit more than a hobby. What do you say? So, yep, he said, fair enough. And um, he was one of those explosive experts who, uh, like many of their kind, uh, they're, they're very sort of cavalier, quite happy to, to you know, muck around with a bit of plastic explosive in their hand and um, be very confident with it, much to the consternation of uh, those around them. Anyway, um, so he was a rather exotic character and uh, they recruited him. Um, Ha! But there was uh, there was a big problem, and that was no ships. How were they going to get there? They needed a ship to, if they're going to sail into the harbour uh, at Marmagoa, and there were just no ships at all. 
Um, I get the impression they hadn't foreseen that there would be no ships at all, but there were really none because they, the Japanese were coming and all the ships in the north of India, they'd all fled south so that they didn't get taken by the Japanese. Um, there really were no ships. So what could they do? Well, there was a bit of an old boys network, it seems. An awful lot of uh, this story involved so-and-so who knew so-and-so, who was a friend of so-and-so, and on it went. Well, and just as Pew, for instance, was brought into this entire thing from a man in Admiralty in London who just happened to know him. Um, so there you go, there's a, a chain of acquaintances. And um, they knew a guy at the, uh, the, the Port Commissioner's office. Um, so they, they would go and see him. And he was a, an ex-member of the Calcutta Light Horse. And all these men seemed very like-minded and were all very ready to cooperate with each other, even if uh, they weren't being told the whole story. And they, they knew, you know, sometimes you just don't ask questions. Um, so they said, well, can you give us a ship from, you know, from the river? And he said, yes, I suppose I could. Uh, what can you give me in return? Because, you know, <clears throat> it is my company's property and, you know, what if it were to be lost? Uh, we could give you a letter of responsibility. Yeah, I'd ought to do it. So they wrote a letter saying if this ship gets lost, it was our fault. And there you go, for that piece of paper, he said, fair enough. I would suggest you take uh, the Phoebe, uh, also known as Hopper Barge Number no. 5. It was uh, not the um, most mint conditioned of, of uh, craft. And when they first saw it, they thought, really? Is, 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 is that ocean going? No, it was a river hopper barge. It was for, for uh, taking silt out and dumping it, uh, keeping the, uh, uh, the, the river navigable. It was never designed for going round the coast of India, but that's what they planned to do it. And they recruited um, uh, to um, captain the thing, a, a Royal Navy officer uh, who's decided, right, OK, um, we can disguise it. I'll put a big tall chimney on it. Uh, extending the funnel so it won't look much like a river craft. It looked like some, from a distance, it might get mistaken for a little a little oil ship or fishing boat or something like that. Um, and so, yep, he got on with it and uh, that he did. So they had uh, now Phoebe and they had to make a 5,250 mile round trip uh, uh, to their target. Uh, it was going to take about 10 to 14 days and the crew, there were going to have to be at least crew, uh, 20 crewmen, maybe as many as 30. And they'd be, they wouldn't, there wasn't going to be room on the ship. Um, and also just the load of all those extra men um, would be weighing it down and it's really not designed to go out to sea. So they would decide, they'd just put a couple of men on board. They would go around with a minimum of crew and then the rest of the uh, Scottish Calcutta uh, the Calcutta Scottish, beg your pardon, and the Calcutta Light Horse would just go across the country by rail, uh, which was quicker anyway, and pr almost certainly more comfortable. OK, so that's what they would do. And uh, uh, they went out to sea uh, in in the, the boat, and the funnel made caught the wind somewhat and made it really alarmingly unstable, but it was quite good for the camouflage, so uh, they kept it on. Um, uh, but they didn't have a permit that could get them all the way around India because they'd be uh, leaving one jurisdiction and going into another. So they would have to, at some point, uh, put in and uh, get permission to carry on. Otherwise, if they were stopped by a, a British warship, they wouldn't be able to explain what they were doing. Um, and by the time they got to a suitable place to do this, already the crew, the, the Lascars, uh, Alaska essentially is a, a native sailor from that region, um, were getting a bit bolshy because, um, hang on, this seems to be quite a long uh, journey out in the sea and this craft isn't really designed for this. Where are we going? They'd been told that it was a salvage mission, but they were starting to have their doubts. And um, <clears throat> so rather than take the ship in. They stopped it outside and rowed in, leaving the Lascars uh, aboard the ship, um, just in case they took the opportunity to jump ship, and then came back, got the permission, um, and then said, we'll double your pay and give you a bonus at the end of it. And that kept them happy. So whew, another crisis averted, and on they went. Um, the orders arrived for the uh, Calcutta Light Horse with what they would have to take on their on their special training course that they'd all told their wives about. But of course they realised, oh no, it's not a training course, is it? This is actually the mission. And uh, they saw that uh, their kit, how it was meant to be civilian kit, okay, um, they had to have a pair of ankle boots with thick felt gummed to the bottom of them and absolutely no hobnails. 
unusual. Uh, a knife, SK, which stood for silent killing. They were to draw a pistol and 18 rounds. Uh, they were also issued with coshes and handcuffs and they thought, is this a police action? I thought we were going in against the Germans, but there aren't any Germans in India. Is this a police action? They started to have their doubts, but never mind, they had volunteered and whew, it was all quite exciting. So yep, they went ahead with it. They got on the train, not all at once. They got on in just twos and threes. Uh, they were very careful. They were trying to keep everything secret and everything inconspicuous. And they uh, made their way across the country. And would you believe it? The train was derailed. Rocks on the line. And that made them really jumpy because was that a coincidence? Or did somebody, did somebody know? Uh, it was always likely to make them a little bit jumpy. When you're in that sort of situation, you're going to read significance into everything. But trains do not get derailed very often. And rocks on the line was very suspicious. Someone had put rocks on the line, but who? Was it Congress Party? Was it terrorists? Was it, did somebody know? Was it them? You think if something bad happens like that, maybe it's something to do with you, but maybe no, it's just the world in general. And maybe it was just, just a really unfortunate coincidence. Anyway, uh, they got to uh, Cochin and that's where they saw uh, the, the, the barge for the first time and they were somewhat dismayed. Not least those among them who couldn't swim. Um, are we really getting on this filthy, stinking vessel? Is this really an ocean-going vessel? Nah, not really. No. By the time they all got on it, there was so much weight on it that it was only about three feet above the water. So any large wave would splash over the side. Um, it didn't fill them with, with confidence. But um, anyway, um, I should say that another use was found for Cartwright. Do you remember that man I described earlier whose son had been lost in, in Burma? Well, he came back and just pleaded with the powers that be, please let me do something. And I thought, actually, we do have a job. Yes, maybe you can do this. Do you want to organize some parties? He said, OK. And it turned out that he did organize some extremely militarily effective parties. I'll get back to that later. Now, um, from uh, Cochin, they set off south and then switched off all their lights, turned around, and then at night went past again, heading north. It was a deception. Um, and as they got closer and closer to Goa, uh, the men on board were almost told what the mission was. They were told that the target was the Ehrenfels. Um, if they could get all the other ships in harbour as well, that would be great. Um, all, all the Al Axis ships, I should say, in harbour, that would be great. But uh, really, the Ehrenfels was the main target. That's the one they would be going for first. Uh, but they weren't told at this point about the other radio. Um, now, they would be divided into five teams. The first team would be given the, char the task of going to the bridge, uh, destroying any radio there and looking for code books. Uh, then the second lot would go after the anchor chains. They would be taught how to use plastic explosives by uh, Yogi Crossley uh, and they would blow away the anchor chains and that would be their job. So then it would be possible to sail out of the harbour. Other men later would be going down to the engine room. Um, then uh, the uh, third group would be going for the other radio. They were the ones who were in the know on that particular mission. Um, the fourth team, they were firemen and they would be going aboard with um, fire extinguishers because it was it was thought very likely that uh, fire would be used as a weapon against them. And the fifth team would be for um, rounding up the enemy crew and, and um, uh, stopping them roaming around the ship and getting in everyone else's way. And anyone left would be uh, for defending the ship. Of course, Nobody wanted that job because it was much more glamorous to be, be in on the raid. But um, yeah, someone had to stay back and defend the ship. And to this end, uh, they had a number of um, uh, they had an amount of, of railway sleepers and uh, sandbags and the like for making a, a defensive point on the ship uh, for, for covering the uh, covering the uh, the assault and the retreat. Um, they would have white circles sewn onto the back of their shirts for recognition. 
and Cartwright would be waiting for them next to some silver painted oil tanks the other side of the bay. So if they had to go into the water they could swim across to him and he would get them out. They issued Cartwright with the rupees and gold um, uh, and some medical equipment as well in case someone was injured and uh, with that money all going well they could uh, bribe their way out overland. Uh, each man was also issued rupees and gold uh, for the same reason. If they can get across overland you could bribe your way across the border or something like that. Um, and um, what would the odds be? Well it was reckoned that they'd be going up against maybe four to one against odds and of course the men they'd be going up against with uh, would be younger and, and, and fitter not just more numerous. Um, three blasts on the uh, Phoebe's horn would be the signal to get back to the Phoebe very very quickly. The Phoebe will be leaving soon. Three blasts, don't forget that. Um, and uh, in Goa at this point was the British consul. I mentioned him before and he thought to himself, hmm, strange thing here. Two guys, I reckon they were agents of some sort, asked me about the address of this German citizen and the next day two German citizens are abducted from Goa and my men have been watching those ships as I have been and it seems that they've been buying a lots of kerosene, taking that aboard, and they've been putting big piles of stuff on the decks. Now I know because my people have found out that they've got batteries and mining explosives and it looks like they've been putting big piles of marble slabs and sheet metal and piling on sacks of flour on top. It could be that they're creating some sort of explosive defence system. I'd better write a report and warn uh, the powers that be that this is happening just in case there is some raid being planned which there might be, you never know. So he typed this report but then he thought Hmm, I don't really want to send it, it's very secret. But he was given a summons to Bombay. Uh, he and his wife were meant to go there and he gave the glad news to his wife. Ah, oh, going to have a, a, a trip out for a bit, won't that be nice dear? And then he thought to himself as well, it's also a great opportunity to deliver that uh, report personally to the powers that be. I know someone in Bombay who'd be very interested I'm sure. Yeah. And he got to Bombay and he handed the note over. And the man had a look, and the uh, commander had a look at it, and he knew exactly what it meant. But unfortunately, it was already too late. He had no way of warning them. Strict radio silence, and besides, where were they at this point? It was strictly needs to know, and he didn't need to know everything. Yeah, it looked like they were sailing into an ambush, but um, he couldn't warn them. Anyway, uh, I suppose I ought to tell you something about my sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. Now, um, uh, you've probably heard of them, but just in case you haven't, um, The Great Courses Plus is a big website and uh, it houses loads and loads of videos of lectures by distinguished professors from around the world, though mainly it's true to say uh, Eastern uh, USA, and they talk on all sorts of topics and uh, you can uh, take advantage of a free trial period if you go to www.thegreatcoursesplus.com stroke Lindy Beige then you will find uh, details of um, the free offer and you will be able to try out the site and during that trial period you'll be able to look at any number of these uh, lectures that you want. You can you can educate yourself in all sorts of topics in maths and history and geography and, and literature and religion and oh it just goes on and on frankly they've got so many uh, lectures. Um, and uh, um, what would be relevant? Uh, do you think people might be interested in this video? Well clearly something a history of the, the British in India and they've got a course, it's one of their many courses is uh, the British uh, in India, history of the British in India and um, that is uh, taught to you by uh, a chap called Hayden J. I don't know, Belnois or Belenoit or something like that. This, this is how it's spelt and you know what Americans are like, they, they, they take a foreign name and then they come up with their own pronunciation which is often very creative though more often just sort of like English. Anyway um, he is a bit of a young whippersnapper. Let's have a quick look at him and uh, let's have a look at his uh, gestures. What, what do we think of this? You see this is, this is not old school cradle work. 
Um, but it's got something. You know, it's, it's fluent, it's rapid, it's confident, he has a, a big vocabulary of moves, but he never holds any of his cradles for any length of time. His hands are a little bit, uh, for my, my feeling, a little bit restless. But it, it's always good to observe new styles, and you never know, you might like it. Um, so, The British in India, uh, 24 lectures. Um, I did notice that an awful lot of the lectures were to do with uh, the struggle for independence and, and, and the like. Uh, I think there's, you know, possibly in 24 lectures you didn't need to spend quite so much time on that particular aspect of the topic. But anyway, uh, the British in India, uh, that's one of the topics uh, that you can get to by going to that address which is appearing on your screen again, or much easier and quicker, just clicking on the link below. It's so much easier. So, free trial period, which is free, so that's good, and you can look at any number of lectures during uh, your, your, your membership. You're not limited. Um, and so the amount of knowledge that will be at your mouse tip uh, is just quite extraordinary, uh, really. And so there you go. Thank you so much for sponsoring me, The Great Courses Plus. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to get on with my uh, story now. So, um, I should say, there is a film about this operation. It's called The Sea Wolves which has got nothing to do with anything. They just called it because they just thought it was, you know, sounded like an action-adventure movie. And they've really tried to turn it into an action movie, and it really doesn't work. A of gratuity. Yeah. It was uh, shot in the late 70s, uh, released in 1980, and boy does it show. Um, you know, they don't make them like that anymore, and thank goodness. Uh, modern films uh, try with costumes, at least for this period, not for medieval period, obviously, in the, any modern film uh, made set in the medieval period still has everyone costumed in sackcloth and ashes, uh, but no. Uh, but for, for, say, things set in the at least 20th century, they, they are reasonably accurate with their costumes, but the sea wolves is just so obviously they're wearing modern clothes. It's just ridiculous. Look at this! He's got a zip up the front of his cardigan. I mean, for goodness sake. And they've all got wide lapels and there's so much polyester. Anyway. Um, it's just not a good film. It stars Gregory Peck, um, because in those days you had to have a big American actor if you wanted to sell a British film to the Americans. Uh, oh, and it stars this chap as well. You know who it is, don't you? Yeah, of course, it's this chap. Uh, oh, no, wait, uh, no, no, this chap. So I, no, no, it's this, oh, is it this chap? Or, or this one? Or this, oh, uh, hmm, who is it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, this is from the American poster for the film, and yes, that's meant to be Roger Moore. Not a good drawing. I think you'll agree. And frankly, I wish Roger Moore wasn't in the movie. Uh, he was, at the time, James Bond, and I think the makers of the, the film went, oh, we've got James Bond in our film! Well, let's use him lots! And so they try to make him into James Bond, and they contrive uh, scenes where he has to go to a casino, or he even goes into a posh party wearing black tie because he's James Bond. Um, and a lot of the film is concerned with um, a... a, a totally non-historical and unconvincing uh, uh, romance that he has with the good-looking enemy agent. and so They're just trying to do James Bond, and frankly, they shouldn't have. Um, uh, anyway, so there is this film called The Sea Wolves, which is supposedly about this operation. Um, so there you go. I've mentioned it so you know about it, but just understand that I'm not recommending it. Uh, one, it's not terribly historically accurate, but two, and this is the main reason, it's just not very good. Um, anyway, um, uh, why did I mention that? Uh, oh yes, right, the title, right. Uh, they were also told what this operation was now called. This was Operation Creek. Uh, so called uh, because uh, if anything goes wrong they would be up the proverbial and without a paddle. Although I'm sure someone, uh, some wag probably also mentioned that it could have been uh, named after the, the noise that the men's knees made. Um, right. The Phoebe, if you remember, had uh, gone around most of India and was now making its way to Goa. Engine trouble. It was overheating and they were going to have to stop. It was going to take some hours, all going well, to replace a vital part. Um, and meanwhile they would be a sitting duck if any uh, U-boat spotted them. So a tense moment, but um, they managed to get the engine going again. Phew! And on they went to Goa. Now, um, they had 
a bit of training time on the way and they were issued with Sten guns and they had Sten gun practice and they were then issued with German ammunition for the Sten guns so that if any um, uh, ammunition uh, spent cartridges were, were found aboard the ship afterwards it would be easy to explain this away that it was Germans firing at other Germans which was one of the cover stories that uh, they, they, would, uh, they were preparing in advance for what had happened. Um, uh, but they trained with British ammunition and just swapped it for the actual going in with captured stuff from North Africa. Uh, they were also taught uh, plastic explosive use. They made ladders out of bamboo. And at night uh, they practiced uh, a few useful skills. One was how to strip down and clear all the jams of um, uh, a Sten gun and then reassemble it. And this they had to do in the dark. So they did it blindfold. Um, and this was vital because uh, it could save someone's life because uh, if a Sten jams and you're aboard a ship at night and possibly all the lights are out, you might be in pitch black. And if your Sten's not working, what are you going to do? Um, so uh, this gained them a lot of familiarity with the weapons that they were going to be using. Um, in the film, they use MP, uh, they use uh, MP40s or MP38s, uh, German submachine guns. But that's just wrong. Anyway, um, uh, and they were also uh, practicing moving around a ship in these felt boots at night, uh, which was pretty alarming because something which concentrated the mind a lot was the fact that if you remember, some of them couldn't swim. Also, they're at night. Uh, in the uh, Arabian Sea somewhere and if they fell off which would be really easy to do this ship because they were just little narrow bits down the side uh, points uh, to move along if they fell off into the sea they would never be found to fall off would be death uh, even if they could swim so uh, anyway none of them did fall in uh, so they were practicing their skills um, and they were given the password which was um, Mathafan which was the name of uh, someone's Welsh cottage. The, the Germans would never guess that. Um, so um, it was time to get in now. I told you that Cartwright had his job to do organising parties and this he did very well. He went to uh, a senior official uh, in Goa and he knew that this official had a couple of uh, of his children at very expensive boarding schools in British India and there had been horrendous inflation in Goa and the rupee was now worth four times what it had been relative to the local currency and so it was costing this poor man a fortune to send his kids to those school, to that school but um, uh, he offered that he could possibly make that problem go away if he would maybe help him organise a party. This would be a party for for uh, all the bigwigs in town, a celebration of neutrality. You could invite all the, 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 the people from all the other consulates and the, and the people from all the various docks and warehouses from places all around the world. And oh yeah, all the captains of all the ships in the harbour, every single one, every nationality, you're celebrating neutrality, yes. And uh, I've got a big budget, so let's have really good wine and let's have really good musicians and let's have, we need a really nice location for it. You can you can do this for me, can you, senor? And yeah, he got that done. He also went into town and had a, a word with a brothel keeper and uh, ended up hiring all the brothels in one street of town for an entire week and they would be free to all the sailors in town um, because, well, why not? You know, he likes to be generous. He's an old rich man, he wants to do something. He used to be a sailor and he wanted to do something with his money, so this he did. And not for one night, you notice, but for a week, because if he did that on just the one night, and it was the same night as that party, that would be suspicious. But a week, and during that week that was the party, wouldn't be so suspicious. And similarly, he organised a big fiesta with more music and fireworks and so forth to be happening all week. Yeah, at his expense, well, at the British government's expense uh, ultimately, but yeah. Um, so he did that side of his job very well indeed. And uh, he he made a, he did a lot of um, sensible things. For instance, he booked far more nights than he needed at his hotel, far more nights at the hotel than he needed. Um, uh, so that uh, if uh, he were to d d um, disappear on, and everyone could then check the records and see, oh, he was always planning to go upon that time. Wait a minute, 
that time is the same day as the party and they could you know, possibly put two and two together. So he booked for a few extra days so that uh, there wouldn't be that coincidence that people could pick up on. Uh, anyway, um, he telephoned his wife from Goa and received the remarkable and joyous news that his son was alive. Yeah, a prisoner, but alive. And oh, the, the emotions that were going through him. Uh, and you can imagine how these emotions then went lurching in yet another direction when, on top of everything else that he had to cope with, he realised that two Portuguese cruisers had just pulled into the harbour and had moored themselves where their guns could see the Ehrenfels and any ship that might pull up along it. Do the Portuguese know? That's one hell of a coincidence. And a lot of African troops disembarked. They'd been bound for Timor, but uh, Timor was in Japanese hands and so they were, uh, they'd come back. But these were Portuguese colonial African troops. Um, and he thought, oh, they got a load of troops as well. Why? Ooh, well, that, yeah, that is a very worrying coincidence. But my son is alive. Um, oh, and I've got work to do, and I'm still in tremendous danger. The mission, yeah, of course, the mission. Right. So they sail into the harbour. Well, actually, they came past. They did the same trick as well. They, they, they went past and had a look at the harbour in daylight and then sailed off north with their lights on, turned the lights off and came back at night. So the same trick as before. And the Portuguese and the German lookouts did see them, but the disguise had worked. They, just, they were not uh, considered a threat. Uh, the Germans were expecting landing craft or maybe a sub, something like that. Um, well, that's just some little craft, little fishing vessel, possibly. It's nothing. It's fine. Nothing to worry about. Um, go back to sleep. So they came back at night and they then had to sneak past the searchlight. Now the searchlight wasn't on all the time but it did come on every night um, and it played out into the water. Now one thing they could have done was just go into that great vast expanse of water out there and try to hide in it and hope that the searchlight never found them but they uh, came up with a, <clears throat> a different tactic which was to go as close as they possibly could. So uh, the searchlight which was raised up uh, shone over the top of them as they put, 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 went past quite close to it and they might have been heard because they were so close but it seems that they weren't. Okay so they got past the first obstacle. Now they're into the harbour. All they need to do now is find where is the harbour boy, the navigation boy. Uh, that's boy, uh, buoy if you're an American. Where is it? It wasn't on. It wasn't on and that was no part of the plan. It was now going to be a lot more difficult to navigate at night. Should they put their lights on? Well, no, it was more of a risk not putting the lights on. And they could see those huge um, cruisers there, two of them. Okay, are we going to abort? Should they abort mission? They had this discussion because something's wrong here. These two cruisers shouldn't be there and the, the navigation light should be on. It's as though they know we're coming and are ready for us. But it was decided that any chance they had of surprise would have to be tonight. So, nope, they're not going to abort. They're going to carry on anyway. Maybe these two things are just horrendous coincidences. And so they pulled up alongside the Ehrenfels. But as they approached it, everyone was really struck by how enormous it was. It was the size of a cruiser, for reasons that I've already explained. But in their imaginations, they'd, most of them hadn't thought it would be that big. Now the party had worked um, and not everyone had gone to it. There was a British uh, freighter in town and the British were notable by their absence. And uh, the neutrality uh, wasn't perfect. It was noticeable that the Danes, for instance, didn't uh, socialise with the Germans at the party. Uh, but at the posh party in the posh house on the hill, things were going pretty well. Nice music, people on the veranda enjoying drinks and so forth. All very cordial and beautifully dressed. Um, and uh, presumably things were going quite well in, in the brothel street and at the uh, fiesta as well. And it, se it seems that uh, they'd got at least half the crews off the ship at that time. Uh, but still the odds were not good. Um, so um, the, uh, they had a little bit of luck. The wind changed and uh, uh, blew their sound out to sea and carried the sounds uh, coming from the various ships they passed. Uh, gramophone records being played on the Italian ship. And was that an oink? 
Was that an oink? It wasn't, it wasn't actually an oink because the, the Italians had turned the deck of their ship into a great big garden and they were re uh, raising various crops and pigs and chickens and it was an oink. Um, anyway, they pull up alongside the Ehrenfels and almost immediately uh, a German lookout puts his head over the side and in German says, Oi, who are you? And in German someone shouted back, Oh, we're just, uh, we're just a harbour barge. Why are you running without any lights then? Uh, now! said Pew, and um, grappled, grappling hooks were thrown up and the uh, bamboo ladders that I mentioned were hooked on and men started climbing up. Um, well, at least that was the plan, but everyone then stopped because there was an awful lot of Achtung, Achtung above them and a whopping great big searchlight came on, doop, illuminating them all. Huh? So you've got a lot of men uh, with blacked faces carrying Sten guns. Um, it's pretty difficult under those circumstances to look innocent, isn't it? Um, but there was a moment of pause where well, the men down in the ship were all oh, looking up and the men up in the ship were looking down. Oh, uh, but then it was um, uh, Red Mac, that was his n nickname, uh, who uh, uh, broke the deadlock by, with his stern gun, quick burst and he shattered the, uh, uh, the front of the searchlight and everything went dark again. Uh, so uh, now everyone's sort of blind because they've all just had a, a searchlight shone in their faces. And uh, now they're going to be deafened as well because the ship's siren sounded and wow it was loud. I mean it was really disconcertingly loud so they're all now blind and deafened but never mind they're doing this and Pew was the first up. Getting up was pretty difficult because um, they had to launch their uh, assault before the uh, Phoebe had come to a full halt. So they're getting onto the, the, the ladders and immediately the ladders get dragged uh, and of course the ship's going up and down a bit and, uh, and these are men who are used to in their normal lives taking the, the lift to the first floor which if you're American is taking the elevator to the second floor but it's still not very much is it? Um, anyway so they're heaving themselves up some of them carrying fire extinguishers and uh, they get onto the deck and the sirens are going there's lots of actong actong around them but they get uh, go about their jobs um, so uh, the first group goes to the bridge and they burst in and oh it's empty. There's no one here. They can't find any code books, uh, no radio, uh, no, never mind. But there are four um, f stories of a superstructure above the deck and they go up another story and they find another room and bash in the door and there's the captain of the ship operating the ship's siren and another officer next to him and um, they just gun them down with Sten guns. Um, they're in a hurry. Um, and that's what they chose to do. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard a Sten gun fire, but you will be amazed how loud a Sten gun, they're very, very, very loud things. And uh, if you fire a Sten indoors, that's much worse. So imagine a small iron walled room. The noise is just, uh, oh, I mean, it just, it, you, your vision is dimmed by the noise. It's, it's very, very loud is what I'm saying. So a little moment to recover from that and the fact that they've just shot some people dead. But right now, uh, look for the code books. Cannot find the code books anywhere. Hmm. Uh, never mind. Um, maybe someone else elsewhere on the ship will find them. And that is true. Uh, now Breen and Crossley in another room came across a German frantically fumbling with some books that had lead covers. The actual, uh, the hardback uh, covering of the book was made it was a sheet of lead. This was to weigh it down so if you threw it overboard uh, during a raid, uh, raid it would be sunk out of the reach of the enemy. Um, and they saw what he was, fit, uh, he was fiddling with, he saw them and went to grab for a weapon of some sort. So Breen changed his Sten gun on and banged. German ammunition. It jammed. Um, Crossley wasn't going to wait to draw a weapon or wait for this guy to get whatever he was going for out. He just rugby tackled the guy and was wrestling around on the floor with him. The guy, however, managed to bring his weapon, which was a hose pipe full of kerosene to bear, and the room suddenly burst into flame. Crossley was quite badly burned and the flames engulfed the whole room, including, unfortunately, the code books. The lead sheeting melted and the, uh, the, the, the book went up in flames. Uh, but they still hadn't uh, defeated the German. They were wrestling around with him, trying to pull him out of the flames, but he was putting up a hell of a struggle. And then Red Mac came by, saw what was going on, and boom, with the butt of his Sten gun, hit the German in, in the head, and that ended that fight. They dragged him out and cuffed him. Um, downstairs there were other there were three men in the engine room whose job was to start the engine and then get everyone out of there but no one had ever started the diesel engine of a ship before and they're all 
thing. Okay, everything's in German. What does this button do? I don't know. Uh, but after a while, they realised one of them did that uh, the injectors, I think that means the fuel injectors, had been removed. And so there was no way that they were going to get that engine started, which uh, shortly later they uh, reported to Grice, who came down to see what was going on. Now, meanwhile, uh, Squire and Manners uh, had been uh, given the job of blowing the anchor chains and they got to one of the stern anchor chains and started stuffing in the plastic explosive. Now, plastic explosive is a lump of, of putty and if you press it slowly and carefully, it doesn't explode, which is nice. And you can mould it into uh, shape. But if you were to hit it with a hammer really suddenly, it can explode and kill you. And, and so they were being a little bit sheepish with it at first, but they'd been shown how to do this, but it wasn't sticking. It wasn't sticking to the anchor chain that they'd been shown because the anchor chain was so covered in rust and was wet and it just it wasn't sticking. So eventually they overcame their uh, ginger tentative uh, treatment of the of the putty and just shoved it in there and it didn't uh, explode and kill them. They put in the fuse, uh, um, set it off and retired to a comparatively safe distance. And then there was a phenomenal crack. And yes, it worked first time. It blew through the anchor chain, this huge anchor chain, which then rattled across the deck and plosh into the uh, into the water below. And they thought, great, one down, three to go. And they hastened across the ship uh, to get to the other stern anchor chain. But but. Oh, Squire said, wait, do you smell that? And he knelt down and felt the deck. It was wet. Run, he shouted to his compatriot, and they did, and only just in time, because at that moment, a German popped up with a flare gun, fired it down into the deck, which then became a huge, great forest of flame. Um, uh, the, the two uh, light uh, Calcutta, horse, Calcutta light horse men managed just to avoid that, but now they were cut off. They couldn't get to the other stern anchor. Uh, chain. Um, so how are they going to cut the ship free? Um, well, uh, it probably didn't really matter given that they couldn't get the engine working, but they didn't know that at this point. Um, now, uh, Grice had come across a door which said on it, uh, high voltage, danger of death, um, and thought, mm, let's have a look at this one. So they blow their way into that room and aha, they found the radio room, the real radio room, the real transmission room, and um, dealt with its occupants. And then with the butts of their stands just started smashing everything up. Every part of that radio had to be very, very thoroughly destroyed. And this uh, they now did. So thank goodness. Uh, right, said Grice. Uh, looks like the first part of a boom there was a tremendous explosion at this point and all the lights went out and all the men were thrown off their feet they crashed into each other into the furniture into the walls and finally into the floor what the hell had just happened well what had just happened was that the germans had decided that this boarding party was uh, apparently overrunning the place and it was time to detonate the explosives uh, that they had rigged up and so they pressed those buttons and all that mining explosive um, went kaboom on the deck um, but you know here's the wonderful thing didn't kill anyone it went on it was a hell of a boom but everyone was below decks or just out of harm's way at that moment and it didn't kill any of the Calcutta Lie Horse or the Scottish or the Calcutta Scottish uh, or the um, SOE agent who was with them uh, or the Force 136 operative who was with them either. So a um, bit of luck there, uh, but ah, pretty bad for the ears. And now they're in a, a ship which is extremely dark, um, a ship which is pretty unfamiliar. Yes, they'd seen plans of it, but um, <clears throat> when you've been disoriented by combat quite this much, um, it, it's pretty difficult to find your way around. And some of them had got quite disoriented. For instance, at one point, uh, a lo load of them had um, rigged up a load of plastic explosives and blown their way through, through a door and burst into the room to find uh, um, Breen, the other side, looking completely startled and, and shaken. And one of them said, uh, open sesame? <clears throat> Wrong door. Sorry. Anyway. Um, it's about this point that uh, the Germans arrive at the quayside. Now, when the sirens first went off, at the party in the posh house, uh, 
The Germans heard the sirens and uh, the, por the Portuguese dignitaries were saying, oh, no, it's nothing, it'll be just a false alarm, it'll be this, the boy, no, it'll, it'll all be fine. But the Germans said, no, that is our ship siren. We need to get there now. And the Portuguese were saying, oh, I'm sorry, senor, but there are no taxis at this time. We've ordered cars for you, but that's for later, for at the end of the party. So the Germans had to, <laughs> in a rather undignified and annoyed manner, they had to run down to the docks from the party. And at this point, a load of panting Germans arrive at the quayside, looking out, and they, they, they're sure that they can hear gunfire. That, that definitely gunfire, and there are flames on the deck of their ship. They need to get out there, but how do they do that? They look around for a boat, they can't find anything. It's low tide at this point, and so they, they wade out a bit through horrible, sticky, stinking mud uh, to find because they found some boats, but there are no oars in the boats. And then arrives a Portuguese police officer with a load of his men, including some African troops. And they say, quick, quick, we need to get out there right now. And you're saying, oh, no, 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 it's probably just a false alarm or whatever. No, no, we can hear, we've heard gunfire, we've heard gunfire. Oh, no, no, that was fireworks. You're mistaken, senor. And in the version uh, in this book, which is a little bit dramatic, this book, um, it's, it's a bit more novel-like than I would uh, want a history book to be. Um, it's a, a, a pre precisely that juncture, a load of fireworks went off and a load of firecrackers. There you go, senor, you see, it's, you're mistaken. And it's just the it's just the fiesta but the germans were unconvinced and they demanded to be taken out to their ship um a motor launch came along uh, the portuguese por uh, police officer with some of his men got in it and said no 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 not you no this is for me i'm going on a reconnaissance and put 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 he disappeared off leaving the germans frustrated on the shore and according to this at, at, at this moment uh, one of the germans went Shies! But there you go. I mean, it's possibly he's just try trying to make everything dramatic. Um, uh, so uh, the searchlight was panning around all over the place. Now, the people on the Phoebe, uh, Captain Davis and uh, uh, the others who had stayed back to defend, uh, was thinking to himself, thank goodness they're incompetent with that searchlight. They're just panning it around all over the thing, going from one ship to the next to the next. If they would just look straight at, if they would just shine it on where everything clearly happening, at the Ehrenfels is, then surely someone would notice us and the game would be up really quickly. But thank goodness, they're, just, they're still looking for something else. Uh, okay, uh, but he's getting uh, pretty worried at, at this point. Uh, time is ticking on and he can't see what's going on. It's a 25 foot cliff next to his uh, little craft, which is only one yard off the water. And um, uh, he's thinking that maybe it's time to shout through the windows, which he'd pegged open for the purpose, to the Lascars that it's it's time to go. Um, and uh, across the way, Cartwright notices that that British freighter is now moving. Now, why is that moving? It obstructs his view for a bit. He was waiting across the uh, the, the bay. Uh, all sorts of emotions going through his mind because he could see that there were flames, he could see that there was gunfire, he knew that there his, a lot of his very good friends were aboard that ship, but he didn't know what was going on. Uh, and he's looking constantly for men swimming towards him. He's ready, uh, but maybe he should go now. And another part of him is saying, maybe I should get on the, on the th car and, and disappear now while I can, but no, that's not my duty. I stay here and I watch. Um, and he did, he watched, in fact, all night until morning. He was never needed again. Thank goodness. Uh, he waited on that, that beach where there were lots of dead dogs and cats that had washed up. He found that place and thought, I'll wait there because no one else, no lovers are going to happen to choose that bit of beach to wait. I will be alone if I wait on that bit of the beach. And he was right. As I say, it turned out that he was rather good at his job. Um, anyway, um, <sighs> Davis was also worried that <laughs> there were gun turrets on that Portuguese cruiser, just one shell from any, any of those gun turrets that hits his craft, would be that, that would be the, the, the end. Or if, if they just sent over just one motor launch full of Marines, the few people he had on board wouldn't be able to hold them off. It would all be over. He was in a very precarious position and he would really quite like to get out of there, but the mission was still going on uh, out there somewhere and he had no radio contact. So he just had to, the only thing he had was three blasts uh, on, on the siren. Anyway, Deep down in the bowels of the ship, there were three Germans uh, next to the Kingston valves. Now, I should explain what a Kingston valve is. It's a valve 
There are sea valves, uh, sea cocks, the, the British call them. Um, I think the Americans call them sea valves. And uh, a Kingston valve is a particular type. They're usually square and they're usually right at the very bottom of a big iron uh, hulled ship. And uh, the pressure of the water is, is greatest at that point and it pushes up the, the square plate of the, uh, of the valve, keeping everything watertight. But if you turn the big wheels and put a bit of effort into it, you can force against the pressure, you can force the, 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 the plate down, opening up a gap and the water rushes in to the bottom of the ship. Now you can use a Kingston valve to scuttle a ship, but that's not actually what they're for. Uh, obviously when you're in dry dock they can let the water out of the ship, uh, but when you're at sea uh, you might have a fire aboard that might be uh, right near the, in, in the bottom of the ship and so you could put the fire out by flooding the bottom of the ship and then when you've got the fire under control you can later pump the water out. Um, or maybe you need the water in the ship to fight some other fire and you need a big supply of water. That's handy. So for putting out fires. Also what if you develop a leak in some part of the ship or some of the cargo shifts and your ship is unbalanced and it's it's leaning over well if you flood this compartment by opening the valve you can uh, right your ship again okay your whole ship is going to be lower in the water but at least you're upright um, so they have practical uses but one thing you can do is you can scuttle a ship and that's what these Germans were doing so they opened the Kingston valves and the room was started flooding very very quickly and the place is still dark but they knew the ship well and they had to race to get up to the deck and they got up to the deck and they saw a wall of flame and they saw that there was one of the Calcutta light horse just there and they thought right there are three of us there's one of him let's get him and they charged through the flames and it was Red Mac he had a, a fire extinguisher with him and he just saw them in time to go and squirt them in the face with his fire extinguisher ha got you you bastards um, but there were still three of them and they were younger and bigger than he was and they bundled onto him and it looked like everything was over but at that moment uh, because of the, the flooding the whole ship suddenly violently tilted and the Germans fell over and slid away and presumably Red Mac was able to grab hold of something so he didn't just slide straight after them but then two more Germans sprang out of the woodwork and these were armed with clubs and one of them boom, clubbed him quite badly in the head but he wasn't actually out but almost but two more uh, Calcutta light horsemen then turned up and there was another fight and then the, the, the ship tilted again and um, one of the Germans then spoof, knocked himself out with his head smashed against the deck and they were able to cuff uh, and, and get a couple of uh, cuff the, uh, the Germans and get a couple of prisoners that way um, and it's at this point uh, that uh, Davies down in the Phoebe now thinks oh wow this is not looking good at all it's time to go because this huge cliff wall of the of the Ehrenfels next to him right next to his tiny little hopper barge is now tilting over and over and over this is no I don't want to be here okay he blasts three siren blasts and alerts everyone on the ship it's time to go get back here ready or not I'm, I'm going Going. So uh, they, they hear this, they know what, exactly what it means and they start uh, running back. Now in fact they were a little fortunate in that it had tilted that way and not that way um, because because it tilted that way. Do you remember I said it was a 25 foot climb up the bamboo ladders and, and grappling ropes and so forth? Well um, by the time most of the uh, Calcutta light horse got back to the side it was only a three foot jump. They didn't need the ladders which were all snapped and, and broken by the, the tilting but they didn't really matter. It got so low they could just jump the last three feet onto the deck of the Phoebe which they then did and uh, they actually had three prisoners with them and uh, uh, someone on board said right, are we all here? Yeah yeah I've counted them all back sir. We're all here. Great okay we're leaving and he starts pulling away from the ship which is now uh, on fire and blazing away. There were, there were parts of the ship that were glowing red hot from the, the fires and the various explosions that had uh, occurred up to this point. Sir someone is signalling us. What? Someone is signalling us says uh, someone to, to Bryce and sure enough they could see some, some uh, torches flashing in the night. Uh, a torch is what the American called a flashlight and uh, Oh right, well, ha. so some Germans say, well give them a burst of Bren. They had a couple of Bren guns that were back on the ship. It didn't matter if, if British ammunition fell onto the Phoebe. Um, 
And uh, the men, who were already, by the way, they got back to the fever and immediately started drinking strong spirits. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think I can understand why, to be honest, but maybe it was a little bit early to do that sort of thing. Anyway, one of them had, had already uh, got through a huge amount of alcohol, um, said, right, I'll give him a burst of bread. But uh, fortunately, the, uh, the Phoebe was uh, in the various, the, the wake of this collapsing ship, was bucking and rearing. All his uh, rounds went wide, I say fortunately, because it was two of the British who turned the, the, the torches onto their own faces. Did you ask you? It was, um, I don't know, who was it? It was, um, uh, it was, it was Wilton and Breen. It was Wilton and Breen. And good God, it's Wilton and Breen that they'd miscounted because of the prisoners. It was dark. There was a bit of a rush. Uh, okay, so they had to turn round and, and they pick up Wilton and Breen, get them as well. That's definitely everyone. Okay, now we're really off. Now, there were captains and lookouts on the other German ships and the Italian ship looking and what they had observed is a craft had pulled up to the Ehrenfels, a load of men had jumped aboard, there was an awful lot of banging and flames and more banging and blah, 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 and the entire ship had, had, had keeled over on one side and started to go down glowing red with fire. So they thought, blimey, those Royal Marine commandos or whoever they are made short work of that. And now look, they're setting off again and they're in another and, and, and they've all got back in the ship and maybe they're coming for us. So uh, the, the German captains did the logical thing, which was that they scuttled their ships as well. And at last, uh, the, 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 the Italian scuttled his ship and down it went. And a lot of pigs had to learn how to swim in a great hurry. So a lot of swimming pigs about, uh, which was a remarkable sight through the binoculars of Bryce. And uh, according to legend, he at this point said, oh, well done, the Italians. Late as usual. Um, so there was a feeling you could imagine of elation, uh, primary mission accomplished, um, and the other ships were all now scuttling themselves and, and going down in flames. But um, they were far from out of danger yet because the one shell from those cruisers would finish them. And the Portuguese, they're still in Portuguese waters, don't forget, in Goan waters. So the Portuguese could, could send motor launches after them and they've got to get out, out of the harbour and they've got to get past the searchlight again. They, they went out the same way as they came in. Uh, and they've got to get out and clear. They've got to get through. They've got to get past what's called the three mile limit. They've got to get out of Goan waters into quite definitely non Goan waters. If, they're, uh, if they were caught in Goan waters, they would be interned for the rest of the war, assuming they weren't killed, but more likely interned for the rest of the war, which is something they didn't want. They'd got wives to get back to in, in Calcutta. Um, and of course, the engine has to overheat again at this point. And whereas before, they said, look, we're going to have to stop this time. We just can't stop. If it if it overheats and seizes up, well, there we go. We've just got to we've just got to gun this engine for all it's worth. We've got to get out of here. Um, now, of course, it could be that they would get out and immediately get sunk by a U-boat because it could be that a German had had time to signal we are under attack by Royal Navy forces, uh, and there might have been a U-boat waiting for them, and that was just something that they couldn't do anything about. Really, they just had to worry about. Well, I suppose that is doing something about it. Oh, that and drinking more brandy. Um, so uh, they got away. They got uh, out of Goan waters. Um, they, and, and to help out, they, they all stripped off the shirts and all started taking turns, stoking the engine, uh, uh, doing the, the, the Lascar's job. And uh, they did have a radio aboard, but they'd been uh, maintaining strict radio silence up until this point. But they just sent a single word. Longshanks. Longshanks was one of the three code words that had been agreed uh, in, in the advance. One was, we've captured all three ships that, which are now underway. One was, mission has failed. And Longshanks was, we haven't captured them, but they are destroyed. So it was a sort of mission accomplished message. And it uh, <clears throat> went through the ether and was picked up by a uh, commander somewhere. So someone was uh, picking up an A N K. S message ends. Okay, so it's Longshanks, sir. That's just all it says. Longshanks. <laughs> They've done it. Well, when uh, they got back, which took quite some while, and getting back was a bit of a story in itself because, of course, they're, they're all covered in burns and bumps and bruises and scrapes, and they don't have many clean clothes and the like. They've clearly been through the mill and when they arrive back uh, they go to a posh hotel to, to clean up and have a nice stay and then they see themselves in the mirror and think no this isn't going to work. No one is going to be convinced that we're just ordinary travellers and besides 
what if we meet some of our friends? Because, you know, we move in social circles like that, so they had to disperse to uh, less uh, comfortable, but perfectly adequate, uh, I'm, I'm sure, accommodation. And uh, anyway, they, they, got, they got back, and the, uh, the, the commander um, uh, back in, in Bombay, the um, senior army commander, just at first flatly disbelieved them. He couldn't believe that uh, 18 old codgers in a hopper barge could go all the way around India and take out a, a cruiser and three freighters, four and a half million pounds worth of shipping, and then get back again without a single man lost. I mean, that's just impossible, but after a while the evidence mounted up. Oh, and he had to accept, yeah, that actually, that actually happened. And the stories, remember I said earlier that they had stories prepared in advance? Well, those stories uh, appeared in the newspapers the next day because they had them all ready in advance. And the, and the newspapers all claimed that uh, a load of uh, pro-Nazi and anti-Nazi Germans had had a, a fight and that they ended up scuttling the ships. Um, uh, or another version of the story was that the morale was incredibly low uh, amongst the Germans and they had uh, scuttled the ships. There was actually a trial. Uh, the, the, the Portuguese authorities uh, put them on trial for scuttling the ships, which you're not supposed to do, and they were found guilty and imprisoned in Goa. But actually they had a, a, a very pleasant uh, imprisonment. They were able to buy for themselves very nice conditions. They still worked in town at various jobs repairing stuff. They, they would repair watches and sewing machines and stuff like that, garage mechanics. And um, uh, even after the war, in fact, even after Goa went back to, um, sorry, when, when it was annexed by, by uh, the, the new state of India in uh, 1961, a lot of the Germans stayed on and uh, became actually quite rich, successful men, raised families there. Um, so so get, Goa sort of won. Uh, the Germans didn't exactly lose. And the British, so it was win with all round, really. Um, uh, well, not quite, because I mentioned a chap called Breen. Well, when he got back to his office in Calcutta, his boss, who was saying, oh, we've had so much to do with you away. Thank goodness you're back after your jolly jaunt wherever you've been. Um, you look, I thought you said you were, you were going up to, to, to Ranchi. You look very sun sunburned. I, if I didn't know better, I'd say you'd had some time at sea. Anyway, uh, there's going to be a hell of a lot of work coming on because, would you believe it, he worked in an insurance office. Four ships that we have insured have gone down in Goa. <laughs> I really wonder what... The law must be quite a grey area because if you can prove that the insurance company itself, one of the employees, had actually sunk the ships, then presumably you couldn't claim. Uh, also, could the insurance company claim compensation for the British government, which officially hadn't ordered the mission? Um, it's a bit of a legal grey area, <laughs> that, isn't it? Uh, but... Um, he, uh, he uh, by all accounts, found it extremely funny, uh, but of course he couldn't tell anyone because they're all still sworn to secrecy. Um, now, was the mission uh, worthwhile? Yes, it very definitely was. As military operations go, despite all those parties and free brothels for a week, it was actually very cheap. And they took four uh, Axis uh, ships out of, the, uh, out of the war, including one potential uh, cruiser, but perhaps the greatest change was in the fortunes of shipping in the Arabian Sea. Because whereas before a ship was going down every day, for the rest of the month only one ship went down. The next month only three ships and the U boats uh, they left. They went to Singapore, they went to Rangoon, they were no longer receiving any instructions, they didn't know uh, where. The targets were, were, were they had 28 million square miles of, of ocean to cover and there are only a few of them. Uh, some of them went round the Cape and back into the Atlantic. And so uh, the U-boat menace uh, to the west of India was resolved. And just uh, 18 old codgers, well, middle-aged guys, all out of condition, uh, had, with a bit of help, had uh, brought that about. Um, now, um, in, they had to keep it completely secret, uh, and the, the promise was kept that they wouldn't get any medals. They did not get any medals. They weren't even allowed to wear the 1939-45 service medal. This was a medal that you could get if you were a rail ticket uh, inspector, because you did some vital war work keeping the railways working, you know, and, and what if some enemy agents had come aboard the train? It would have been your job to report it. Uh, oh yeah, even they could get that one, but no, the men of the Calcutta Light Horse, they got 
no medals, but they did invent for themselves an emblem, a seahorse. And um, they couldn't, of course, make a medal in that because as soon as you wear it, people would then ask. But what they could do is they could get seahorse brooches made and give them to their wives. Um, and the wives themselves might not know why they were wearing what they were wearing, but uh, the men of the Calcutta light horse, uh, they would know. And this was all kept secret until it came out in 1974. And uh, shortly after that, uh, this book was written. Uh, but actually, uh, there were still more secrets kept because it wasn't until uh, 2002 uh, that it was revealed that those uh, German prisoners of war, the, the three prisoners of war I mentioned earlier, they actually went on to, became, to become special operations executive agents working in India for the British. Uh, they kept that extra secret. Um, and uh, something else which hasn't, hasn't come out uh, at all yet is... Oh. No, perhaps I shouldn't say.